Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us, especially this um, last week of the semester. I know that everyone is very busy these days. Um, I'm Shalev Roisman. And I'm Andrew Cohen. That's his cue. Um, and, and we're thrilled to welcome today uh, Maggie Blackhawk from the University of Pennsylvania uh, Carey Law School um, in this last installment of the Rehnquist Center's uh, National Constitutional Law Workshop for the semester. And so as a reminder, if you'd like to get on the queue, please just type Q into the chat. Um, but with that, uh, Maggie, you can take it away. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to um, to Andrew and to Shalev for the invitation and for organizing um, this talk. I um, was saying earlier that I'm a huge fan of the University of Arizona, uh, and in particular, their federal Indian law program, as one might imagine, which is um, quite famous. And I've always wanted to go there. And so although I won't actually be there this week, I'll be there in spirit twice, um, today and Thursday, coincidentally, and I hope to someday make it in person because um, I've just, you know, respect so many folks who have uh, done so much at that school, uh, not the least of uh, Andrew and Shalev for putting together this great speaker series. So, so thanks so much. And I know also this is a really hard time for everyone um, generally. I mean, we've been in quarantine for quite some time now, but it's also the end of a really hard academic year. So I'm grateful to everyone for the engagement with my work. Um, I think we've all realized that these conversations are even more precious than we thought they were before we were all stuck in our houses for a year. So thanks so much in advance. Um, and so the particular draft that you have for today uh, is one of a broader project that I'd like to first introduce before offering an overview of this paper. And then I'll talk a bit in closing about where the project is headed. And so I'd be grateful for feedback, not just on this draft, um, but for those of you who are familiar with my work more generally um, on all of it, and in particular on the book that this project will uh, soon become. So let me start with a bit of background on uh, the essay and the project that um, that has really born, uh, that it was born from. So this essay is part of a project that aims to bring Native nations, Native peoples, and the realities of American colonialism into the study of public law within the legal academy. This essay is the continuation of an effort that I began in 2019 with the publication of an article titled Federal Indian Law as Paradigm Within Public Law. And at that time, I was writing against a strong presumption that the law that governs the relationship between Native nations, Native peoples, and the United States was, quote, sui generis and so exceptional as to not be able to integrate into our public law principles. My project um, largely focused on bringing federal Indian law into the study of constitutional law. And I was writing against a literature where many scholars who were later joined in agreement by the Supreme Court considered federal Indian law to be not constitutional law. And because of this consideration, most presumed that the history and doctrine of, indig of indigenous dispossession had nothing to contribute to our understanding of constitutional law, constitutional values, or even discussions of good governance. In that first article, I tackled the erasure of Native peoples from public law head on. So there I tried to show rather than tell uh, by first charting a range of public law doctrines where Native peoples, Native nations, and Indigenous dispossession were central to the, to the development of those doctrines. Um, and then I offered an example of how incorporation of Native people in histories would shift some of our fundamental public law principles. In particular, it unsettled many of our presumptions about how to best protect minorities, that is, with the liberal framework of rights, judicial solicitude, and federal oversight. The structure and history of federal Indian law turned these presumptions on their head. Federal power uh, had been behind some of the most egregious and subordinating policies within Indian country, and rights had often done more to wound than to shield Native peoples. Uh, instead, it was power rather than rights in the form of local or community control that best mitigated against the constitutional failure of American colonialism. And the political branches, rather than the courts, had facilitated this power through the recognition of inherent tribal sovereignty. In the draft that you have for today um, on power and the law, I further unpack the dynamic of indigenous erasure through the lens of a recent Supreme Court case, McGirt v. Oklahoma. And just note that this is um, forthcoming in the Supreme Court Review, which is a journal that has a particular structure to it. It's one that focuses on a recent Supreme Court case and its implications, um, which is very different from my earlier work. 
that tried to move away from courts. Here I am tackling uh, the court and its dynamics head on. But um, I offer in the essay that McGirt uh, provides a helpful case study in the phenomenology of indigenous erasure, so the experience of it, and its relationship to the dominant ideology of our society. So an ideology that contributes to the erasure of native people and of majority and minority governance, thereby entrenching existing power relationships. So social dynamics of power have been identified primarily by sociologists and social theorists, but also political theorists. And one of those dynamics is how power inequities are entrenched through the work of a dominant ideology. These same theories haven't yet made their way into public law in a way that I think that they should be accounted for. Um, but in McGirt v. Oklahoma, the Supreme Court held in an opinion drafted by Justice Gorsuch that quote, huge swaths of Oklahoma, including large portions of the city of Tulsa existed within an Indian reservation governed by the Muscogee Creek Nation. Because these were reservation lands, the state of Oklahoma could not assert criminal jurisdiction over certain crimes committed by Native people against Native people. So the holding could appear really narrow on its face. But the governor of Oklahoma recently raised the decision in his State of the State speech just this last month, calling it the most pressing issue for the state's future. Uh, and that's because the decision could have implications for civil jurisdiction also, including taxation, regulatory affairs, and zoning and because there are four other native nations similarly situated to the Muscogee Creek Nation. And so an application of McGirt to those four other treaties, which the Supreme Court of Oklahoma has recently done, could mean that up to one third to one half of lands within Oklahoma could exist within the borders of an Indian reservation. And this doesn't um, of course stop at Oklahoma. The essay draws on this recent opinion to better explore the dynamic between power and law. Uh, in McGirt, it was widely accepted that the law was settled. Uh, the Supreme Court had reaffirmed a decades old test known as the Solemn Test just one year before in a unanimous opinion with eerily similar facts. One that was not uncoincidentally authored by Justice Thomas. Um, but regardless, it was also widely accepted that, this, that the Supreme Court would not, um, in fact could not, apply that law faithfully because it would result in Tulsa existing within an Indian, uh, Indian reservation. And that was a result that was so absurd that it was unthinkable. It was so unthinkable, in fact, that the first set of briefs in the Supreme Court arguing against tribal sovereignty opened with a photo of Tulsa, uh, so of the skyline of Tulsa, rather than the text of a legal argument. Um, and uh, through this dialectic, McGirt revealed in the breach the taken for granted worldview that native people could not possibly be presumed to govern a major city within the United States even against the force of well-settled law. So in this way, McGirt revealed the dynamic of dominant ideology shaping law. And so that is one big takeaway. But the real lessons of McGirt are revealed in the way that the case ultimately defied this expectation. Native advocates were able to leverage quote law through formal legal texts, historical argument and rule of law principles in order to shape the law in defiance of a public view that saw the outcome as unthinkable and even absurd. Much of federal Indian law operates in a similar manner. So the dominant ideology is one of native erasure. The public doesn't know uh, that native people govern huge swaths of um, territory within the borders of the United States. And this includes a view of the United States as a nation comprised of immigrants drawn to North America seeking liberty and freedom and willing to tame a vast and very notably empty wilderness in order to do so. Uh, because the existence of Native people and Native nations problematizes this ideology, dynamics within the dominant ideology work to erase the history of Native people and deny their ongoing existence, um, at the very least deny their politically, political agency, and at most uh, deny their humanity. Theorists have identified this erasure across a range of discourses from literature to film to map making to art, and have identified its power in myth building, as well as in supporting the development of a settler colonial state. But the law of the United States is replete with recognition of native nations and of tribal sovereignty. So by contrast to public discourse, the law is replete um, with references to native people. Native people have, for example, seized, repurposed and reshaped their own title of the United States code, Title 25, um, it's titled quote Indians, over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries. And many of us are familiar with the myriad treaties formed between the United States and Native nations. So actually treaties with Native nations uh, were the majority of treaties ratified by the United States in its first hundred years. Um, these formal legal texts possess a greater durability than the dominant ideology 
and the legal field allows advocates to fracture the law in order to lower the barriers to reform. Native advocates have long engaged in a process that theories have called hermeneutic dissent, or the creation of vernaculars around power, sovereignty, and conquest to capture the experience of a community excluded from contributing to the dominant public discourse. Rather than tackle the dominant ideology head on, Native advocates instead have taken their novel vernacular to formal lawmaking institutions in order to force those institutions to recognize their experience as legally cognizable and to force their lexicon into those formal legal texts. Advocates then draw on those texts, uh, their recognition of Native sovereignty and of majority minority governance, as well as the histories that they codify in order to interrogate the, interrogate the dominant ideology during the course of advocacy. In McGurphy, Oklahoma, the Supreme Court ultimately held that Tulsa existed within an Indian reservation because it was forced to preference those formal legal texts and historical argument above the power of a dominant ideology that erased Native people. Both the majority and the dissent, at the very least, had to confront the existence of Native people rather than rely on the power of the ide ideology to shape the outcome of the law. Um, I contrast the rule applied in McGirt, the solemn test, against the rule applied in another line of federal Indian law doctrine, so Oliphant the Suquamish tribe, to demonstrate the way that Native advocates are able to better leverage strategies more commonly seen in conservative movements, so formalism, textualism, and arguments from rule of law principles. When the rule before the court forces the court to confront explicitly the power of the dominant ideology and ultimately subordinate it through that confrontation and to weigh more heavily formal legal texts and historical argument. Reflecting upon the outcome in McGirt and the shock that the holding inspired, um, the essay offers three lessons. The first two for legal scholars and reformers more generally and the final lesson offered as advice for Indian country as we work through the implications of McGirt. The first lesson is that theories of law and legal change, especially in the study of social movements, have much to learn from the advocacy of Native nations and power movements more generally. The history of advocacy within Indian country offers theorists a prime case studying the tactics, successes, and, and challenges of a generation's old power movement. Power movements often take the approaches that they do because they're aware of and attempting to navigate the social dynamics of power, including the way that ideology seems to dominate the lawmaking process, especially within the courts. Theorists have much to learn from these movements. These movements are much more aware of and organized around visions of power and disempowerment, and their strategies make legible the dynamics of power that these social movements navigate in order to enact enduring legal reform and the shadows of that ideology. The second lesson is to explore in greater depth the work of history in relation to power and law. So not only does history add context to legal text, but it also could unsettle or further entrench existing power inequities. In McGirt, as well as in federal Indian law overall, history does important work by interrogating that ideology and revealing its nature as contingent. I offer in the essay an additional way that advocates might leverage history to unsettle prevailing power structures. So forced to confront the existence of Indian country, the dissent took a different tack in relying on stereotypes and misconceptions about the problems presumed to be inherent in majority minority governance describing Native nations within the Indian territory as both racist and corrupt. So the use of historical argument forced this confrontation, but historical argument could have also pushed the discourse beyond simple stereotype by revealing also the promise of majority minority governance for reaching a more just society and forms of liberal egalitarianism yet unrealized within the United States. So lastly, this essay offers advice to Indian country as we work through the implications of McGirt for the state of Oklahoma and the five tribes. Rather than give ground to shore up the dominant ideology, Native representatives should continue to implement the types of strategies that have secured more durable successes over the last 200 years. Focus uh, that, and that is focus advocacy strategies on transforming formal legal texts and to not concern their advocacy with public discourse. Uh, especially when that discourse is inflected with the erasure of Native people. Um, so what does this strategy look like in practice? It means pushing forward with legal positions in, even when they're perceived as so radical as to appear absurd and codifying those positions into legal texts, and even when the public might disagree or not understand. Um, this is less public relations and more um, legislative advocacy, for example. Indian country has no obligation to change the public mind or to reform a recalcitrant nation state. Instead, Native advocates should focus on ways to shift power to their communities, build infrastructure around that power, and aim to change the world as it is, not just the world as the public perceives it to be. 
That way, the next time federal Indian law breaches the public's false consciousness, the world that is exposed as natural includes the fully realized promise of Native nations and of majority minority governance. So in closing, I wanted to gesture briefly again to my intent to expand this project into a book. I'm currently in negotiation with presses and although notably behind on my proposal, um, my intent is to expand the article essays and op-ed I've crafted for this project into a book on American colonialism and public law, its silences and its potential. So um, on that note, thank you very much. And I look forward to your feedback. Thank you so much, uh, Maggie. Just as a reminder to everyone, uh, if you want to get on the queue, you can just type Q into the chat. Um, and so for now, Andy Cohen will start us off. Well, thanks so much, Maggie, for that wonderful presentation in this uh, really thought provoking paper. I'm wondering how much you mean to suggest uh, with this project um, that organizing around power is a more effective strategy for social movements generally. Um, uh, than organizing around rights or how much of this is specific to the native context. Uh, and if you mean to suggest that this is a strategy uh, which is generally more promising, um, I'm wondering to what extent it depends on the particular context in which it's employed. So for example, could native groups have employed or pursued the same strategy without already functioning tribal governments with control over substantial territory um, can we expect other marginalized groups without such governments and territory to follow uh, that example? Um, and are there any circumstances under which uh, you think uh, a rights-based strategy might be more promising? Uh, you know, it, what, is the, what is the role of context uh, in, um, I, I guess, um, creating the conditions uh, under which this particular strategy might be expected to flourish? Yeah, so thanks so much for that question. I think it'll give me the space to clarify um, that I, although I am introducing and trying to outline the power organization strategy as one that's employed by native people and one that I believe needs to be integrated into our theorization of social movements and legal change, I don't mean to try and frame it as something that should replace or exclude organization around rights. Um, nor do I even intend to describe it as something that is more effective um, than rights in all instances, um, or even more effective than rights for Native people. I can probably argue for ways that rights um, organizing has been problematic for Native people, and we can work back around that, but I think effectiveness is it's a hard measure in the context of social movements, especially when we defer to social movement strategy as its own logic. Right? We, we want to think that social movements have their own decisions to make and we want to let them make their own decisions. And so it's, it's a bit condescending to turn around and go, no, you, you're doing it wrong. Um, but I do think that um, in many ways, the conversation around social movements, legal change and organizing has focused too much on rights. And so to the point now that I'm even having to draw the distinction between power movements and rights movements, of course they draw this distinction themselves. So this is an, an emic category, one that I feel comfortable um, holding on to, but I'm not sure it's always going to be one that the legal academy needs to hold on to because in fact, you see many rights, um, uh, rights uh, groups that have organized around rights using power movement strategies and vice versa. And that I do think in, rather than arguing for a replacement of one versus the other, it's an expansion of strategies around which movements can organize. So one doesn't have to be in, in a holy rights movement or one doesn't have to be a holy power-based movement, but in many ways, uh, these movements can learn from each other and expand and refine the ways that um, legal change is enacted and to hopefully uh, achieve more substantial and potentially um, uh, anti-subordinating legal change through the uh, employment of both strategies and the organizing around both strategies. That said, um, getting to your question of when are rights, um, uh, when is organizing around rights a more promising form of organization than around power? Uh, I think the paradigmatic case would be integration versus non. So a rights movement 
rights are themselves a practice. Um, and I have this more in my in my paradigm article from 2019. Um, rights are a practice that um, is often aimed at making a claim on another government. And so the practices that are organized around rights are really trying to change this other government, which is why you see much more public discourse change and more focus on um, trying to change the, the broader public consciousness because the aim is to try and change that broader nation state and that broader government to be more inclusive, uh, to be able to integrate those groups, right? And so if your aim is to integrate, rights are better for that, especially as currently framed. One can reshape rights to be more power-like, of course, and both of those categories start to fall apart without the organizing strategies around them and giving them meaning. Um, but rights would be better for integration. Power, by contrast, is a practice, at least as currently formulated, that brings people around creating their own collaborative vision of the good and control over their daily lives that doesn't require a claims making process on another government, right? And so um, trying to uh, bring those, um, that uh, practice into a group um, of looking to a different government versus trying to almost seize the reins of one own, one's own government um, is a very different practice. And so you can see those strategies working better or worse in different contexts um, and because they have very different aims. Um, so the, the question about conditions, I think is interesting and important. So do you think, do I think that organizing around power without the structure of tribal governments and the um, oversight of territory is something that is possible? The answer is, um, of course, yes. I think that the way that the materialism of human beings, they need to have their lives flourishing and they're going to need, you know, um, a certain social space and certain uh, material life that usually is required. Uh, you need land, you need collectivity, you need proximity to be able to do that, uh, which is something we've learned all too well this last year, um, that uh, we can't seem to replace uh, that kind of proximity with other forms of technology. And so getting land acquisition and organizing one's own government is part of the power strategy. Do I think that that can happen in other contexts? Yes, because it was organizing around power that gave tribal governments the idea that government was necessary and that land was important. Um, you can have it without land. So unions are a similar structure where they're organized around power without land. It's more associationally based, but many of them have that proximity to them um, through local chapters and other forms of structure. Uh, but it's, we can't presume that the organizing around power uh, is something that's just intrinsic to native people. So the fact that native people had separate governments and controlled land masses is something that native people did themselves. And it hasn't existed uh, as a flat um, um, status over time. So over the last 200 years, even under the United States government, native people have had more or less structured tribal government, and that is largely through the very intense intervention of the federal government to break up tribal governments, right? But then they have recreated those governments because of the organizing strategy around power. The idea of holding on to land and land masses, again, has had more or less success over the last 200 years. And you could say that the process of allotment that has really broken up a lot of reservations um, and changed the face of them um, is itself something that has undermined the ability of tribal governments to hold those land masses, but they have instead found ways to reorganize around reclaiming land and the land back movement is an example of that. But Native people are not the only people to have organized around la land and government. And I give an example in the history section of the essay about different forms of black nationalism, uh, the all black towns movement, for example, that is now getting recreated to a certain extent in the South even today where um, uh, people who are um, forming communities through acquiring land and creating all black um, neighborhoods, uh, for example. And so those, those same sorts of dynamics do exist in other contexts um, as, as well as seeing um, a less um, static view of those states of being within native people. So they've not always had just completely concrete tribal governments and not always held land mass. Um, and so the, the, I think the presumption is that the 
there's something about native people that is making them uh, do that rather than the organizing around power that's actually um, creating that outcome. And I think it's the latter. Great, thank you. So I have Mark Graber on next. A, a comment and a question. The comment is in fact in the last speech Thaddeus Stevens gives in the 39th Congress, which passed civil rights legislation and the 14th Amendment, in fact, says, very nice that white people give African Americans some rights, but he's rather specific. The goal is that African Americans should be empowered to protect themselves. So, in fact, the civil rights movement of the 1860s is actually about power and not rights. And I'll put the full quote in chat after uh, done. The question is a suggestion that you might want to spell out a little more what you mean by dominant ideology. So one question about it is how dominant can it be if it can't get five votes on the Supreme Court? And by the way, I don't see howls of protest coming from the legal academy, from people in this room, from the Democratic Party. So I was sort of curious exactly what was meant there. And as a variation, taking some quotes of the paper out of context, one might easily argue another example of power over law is the decision in Obergefell, the decision in capital punishment, that this was the best essay of Scalia's Constitution should be about backsliding. Darn, we signed that treaty in 1888 and none of this living Constitution nonsense. But as your smile indicates, it plays out differently in other areas of the law and is the real lesson that living constitutionalism, like everything else, is a tool when useful but may not be useful in the Native American context. Yes, I mean, I wish I could just answer, answer yes to all of your comments. So thank you so much for all of them. Um, so the, the um, thank you so much for the comments. I think you're exactly right that, um, and of course, you know, you know much more about this, this time period and area than, than, than I do, but the idea that there are power movements aspects to things that we have now classified as rights movements because we really as the the legal academy has done this more historians are less in this vein they've done a lot more work around power movements especially more recently um, but the stories that we tell in the legal academy often exclude the power movements um, and exclude discussions of power and i think your work is is the, clearly the exception to that rule uh, but i think we need more of that um, to better understand these dynamics and it's less about <laughs> this is more true, or this this is more effective, and much more about let's just get as academics at, at the closer to the truth, um, closer to what happened, and closer to the way law is functioning and society is functioning than we currently are. So the question is more about dominant ideology, and if it can't get five votes, so the the um, um, actually, let me get to the Obergefell because I think that this is a really this is really important. So I think you're exactly right, and I cite actually I think I cited to Obergefell in there, um, and the idea that uh, Kennedy in particular has created spaces where the test actually is preferencing a dominant ideology that changes over time. So the whole point of this essay, which I can't get into here, and I think it really has to be more of a companion piece that engages more deeply with all the social movement theory directly, but it's gesturing to something where the dynamics are acting in a way that's counterintuitive to the to our vision of what progress looks like within the court, which is preferencing public discourse. So within social movement theory, some theorists of social movement, um, not all, have completely conflated public discourse and law and said that there really is no difference between the two. Um, and in fact, that's great because it's a progress narrative that creates more representation and is a way that we get at representation for the dead hand of the constitution. Again, this is living constitutionalism in its most full-throated form. And they think that they're getting at this in a way that social movements are able to come in and change the public discourse. And so that this is uh, like a form of popular sovereignty. Um, however, these theorists haven't 
reflected deeply on the sociology of power in the context of ideologies and the entrenchment of a dominant ideology within a society that often resets itself to a way that justifies power inequities within that society, right? And so the, the idea that we have um, public discourse driving law is good unless we're also, uh, is, is not as good unless we're also thinking about the ways that this is entrenching power through the um, not interrogating these beliefs that a society holds that are used to essentially justify the inequities in that society, right? So white supremacy is of course, one of the easiest examples in the sense that we had um, a, an aesthetic and a vision of the United States that ran through the 20th century that depicted um, only white people really and largely in media and other forms of outlets, right? And so that was the dominant public discourse um, and so America is essentially coded as white. You had that kind of Oscar so white theme happening um, a few years back where people just didn't even realize that all of the media really was very one-sided around its racial depictions of the United States. Um, and to the extent that it displayed people of other races, it was often through stereotypical form. And it was only through the interrogation of these taken for granted views of the United States that people even began to realize that that was problematic, right? That's not true in all areas. So Obergefell can be distinguished by saying that this is a problem of our society that has been brought to the fore, that has been publicly debated, that has two sides to it, maybe multiple sides to it, that people are now cognizant of and really are taking a position on. And so the court is involving itself in that space. Um, and that is distinct in some ways from ideology, which is something that is just a taken for granted view of the United States that's not at all, or the taken for granted view of the world that's not at all interrogated. So contrast the debates over same-sex marriage, which was probably at one, cent, one point really in the background of people's um, thinking and much more taken for granted, was brought to the fore, interrogated, and made into um, a, a rule for the court to be able to integrate. Contrast that against Native people, where we're not having a public debate over the existence of Native people and Native nations and Native governance, quite the contrary, right? So this is an ideology that basically just re-entrenches the erasure of Native people, and we're not, um, we're not trying to solve that. And Native people aren't going to try to solve it also, you know, which is the, the um, the description that I have in the essay is that it's actually been more beneficial for Native people as an advocacy strategy to try and circumvent the ideology, to just work under the shadow of it by going directly to lawmaking institutions, changing the discourse within those institutions by codifying formal legal texts that are more enduring than this public discourse that resets itself and trying to fight there rather than doing what folks have done around gender and other um, racialization categories to try and change public discourse to tr then try and change the law. Um, so it's just, a, it's a different avenue, um, but it's one where the, the structure of the ideology actually does make a difference in the way legal reform happens. And I think um, rather than, you know, changing the entire conversation, at least including Native Nations makes us aware of that extra dynamic behind these things and can add some nuance to our understanding of how legal change should happen to where we understand that interrogation is important. And to the extent that we're just putting taken for granted presumptions into law from public discourse, that this is what the public believes, this is what the public thinks, we may codify something that uh, hasn't been, that is much more taken for granted and it's much more power driven than something where the public has deliberated over it and come to a, a broader consensus on norms and values. But I can include that in the paper. I'll put more in the paper. So thank you so much for, for uh, asking that question. Great, and so I have Rebecca Zitlow next. Hi, um, can you see me and hear me? Yeah, I can. okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Maggie, I loved your first paper. So, I mean, your 2019 paper so much. I mean, just just really eye-opening and paradigm shifting and just really made me think a lot. And I'm excited about this new paper. I'm thrilled to hear that you're writing a book on this as well. 
Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role courts play or don't play in the two sort of the rights versus uh, power um, uh, strategies uh, with the rights, of course, at least uh, the way we think about them conventionally, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, African Americans going to courts to enforce their rights. Um, and so just interested in hearing what you have your thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that the um, it's it's funny. I've, um, the the format of the Supreme Court review is one that really um, preferences the Supreme Court that puts front and center Supreme Court decisions. And so I am trying to draw lessons from um, from McGirt. And, and also the practices around uh, the court seem to be that we want to learn from the court to predict from the court. And again, McGirt isn't about predicting from the court. It's more about um, it doesn't even say where the court is going, I think, because uh, we've changed composition since then, but it, it is a breach in the way the court normally operates. So the lessons to draw from McGirt are really that the dominant ideology is one that affects the court with regularity. And if we don't suss out those moments of deep public deliberation from taken for granted presumptions that entrench power inequities, we're going to have those entrenching power inequities codified into law over and over again in the context of the court. And so I think that my work broadly, including um, the 2019 piece, but also all of my work on petitioning has really tried to pull legislatures and administrative agencies into conversations about how to, um, how to empower minorities and also how to protect minorities within democracies. And also to problematize the, the general vision of the rest of the government outside of courts as um, majoritarian and simply majoritarian. Um, so the, the role of courts in our traditional story of you know, rights and courts is that courts are protectors of minorities. You know, the, um, we have the least dangerous branch. We have the, the branch that's supposed to be really understanding that's less responsive to political pressure. So we, if we envision these other two branches as really majoritarian um, driven, uh, that means that the court is this wonderful protector, that judicial solicitude is a way to protect minorities against those majorities that run those other branches. But if you look at the history of those other branches, which is something I study in the context of petitioning, they're not actually deeply majoritarian in their policymaking or lawmaking process. And in fact, if you see the way that the court, as I just described, is really responsive to public opinion, and now at least as it's been theorized in the civil rights movement, as really responsive to public discourse, um, it can be more, quote, majoritarian and sometimes more authoritarian than these other branches that are at least forced to engage directly with the plural values of the United States. They're, they're forced to face the people that they're regulating and to hear from them either through lobbying or petitioning or other forms, other mechanisms, they are actually better suited to understanding plural norms and values and to crafting remedies, to crafting laws that maybe only regulate these areas uh, rather than courts, which deal with Indians as this blanket term, for example, that deal with uh, the United States uh, and nationally um, and can't craft uh, really nuanced or narrow uh, laws or remedies to deal with the cases that come before them. So courts, um, and they also have a very limited view, uh, even um, in descriptive representation. So we had um, women, um, we had RBG, you know, after the women's rights movement that brought the women's rights movement into the courts. We had um, Thurgood Marshall that brought the civil rights movement into the court. However, when we deal with issues that haven't been quite literally brought into the court in forms of representation, the court doesn't have the um, institutional ability to really suss through those values on the other side. And this is no more apparent than in the context of federal Indian law, where the Supreme Court focuses on, uh, and this is all throughout its opinions as well as oral argument, the rights of non-Indians, uh, potentially even the rights of Indians as citizens, but it doesn't have the language to talk about the structural value of tribal sovereignty, nor does it ever suss through the constitutional problem of uh, colonialism, of conquest, of the disempowerment of native people as um, a longstanding problem for our constitutional framework. 
And you can see this in McGirt where the dissent is actually arguing for a rule whereby the Congress disestablishes a reservation by breaking treaty promises and violently criminalizing the other um, nation states government, taking their property. Um, and this is the dissent without any blinking, right? Decide, uh, writes into their dissent that this should be the rule that the rule to determine whether or not Congress is intended to disestablish this reservation should look like violent conquest. We should make that legally cognizable. That vision of power should be one that we codify into law and see as not problematic at all. Uh, and no one actually raises the issue uh, that this is conquest and may undermine our vision of constitutional democracy that we hold so dear and that there might be other values at stake simply than the uh, than what people in Tulsa quote might think when they wake up the next morning to believe that they're in an Indian reservation. Um, so the court really has shown itself as nowhere near um, the ability to suss through all of the big moral value normative questions around um, the intersection of the Constitution and the realities of American colonialism, both its histories and uh, it at present. Whereas the Congress and the president and the executive branch, the administrative branch, they've done wonderful things in the last 50 years, obviously not perfect. Um, and that's because they've actually had to engage with the populations that they are regulating. And so I am a strong proponent of legislative constitutionalism as a field that needs um, more study, uh, in addition to um, trying to explain federal Indian law and uh, non rights based, non courts based intervention for minority protection and impairment. Uh, thanks. And so I'm going to uh, use my prerogative to ask a question because uh, it uh, relates pretty directly to what you just said about the dissent in McGirt. Um, and it's a question about the use of history. And so, in um, I, the paper I felt like had kind of two visions of history. One was bad and one was good. And I was just trying to reconcile them. And because when I typically think of the use of history in, uh, in, in terms of interpreting law, it almost always just privileges powerful institutions. So in separation of powers, uh, if you look at how historical branch practice is used, it tends to favor the president over Congress because the president can act more. In, uh, in customary international law, um, you know, there's a lot written about how that favors powerful, powerful states because the states are the ones that act and action is what creates law and that acquiescence is what is their counterpart, but then the state can, can coerce acquiescence. And so when I, and then that's kind of similar to what you're saying about the McGirt descent where basically they just want to recognize this like violent history is changing facts on the ground. And um, because they're looking at history that further entrenches the power dynamics. Um, but then at the end, you kind of uh, suggest that history could be used constructively to, um, you know, educate us about erasure and marginalization, um, which I, I obviously agree, but I just wonder, um, like, how you think it would be used practically or what mechanisms we could use to ensure that history is used constructively rather, rather than as just another tool uh, to further historical oppression. No, thanks so much. It's a great question and one that I think is really important of how do we suss out one history, um, especially in saying, okay, look, we've just done this for a long time. So kind of Burkean conservatism, we've done this for a long time, we're going to keep doing it. We've done this for a long time, so that's clearly executive power. Um, so I think that the, um, the good uses of history are ones that interrogate um, those practices for values over time and ones that those histories reach deeply enough to both accurately capture that period and also capture periods of which we are less proud. Um, and so the, the hard part is when history is used because we don't normally just point to history to go, oh, we kept, we've been doing it a long time, so let's keep doing it. That's not little c conservatism, right? We keep doing it because we've been doing it and we like what it's done, right? And so the, the hard part is when our histories, which have for a long time told stories about, we liked what we were doing. Um, so 
you know, the, the darker part of our historical texts on slavery often depicted happy people who were enslaved. You know, it was a happy place and, or to the extent that they depicted people who were enslaved at all and the enslavers at all um, in, in the act of enslavement, it was, it was a happy space. Uh, and so that was the effort to go, look, we're gonna keep doing this or practices around this because it wasn't a problem or to the extent that we've stopped doing it, it's now completely over. Right, and neither of those narratives are true. Um, so I think that the bad history is one with inaccurate values and outcomes that are depicted. And I think we can find that all over the place, but no more true in the context of federal Indian law where our stories about the long 19th century, which leave out kind of antebellum descriptions of American governance because we're really fixated on the Civil War and the way that those constitutional changes are a progress narrative about the constitutional structure of the United States. And we forget that the executive power that we have was really transformed in the context of Andrew Jackson. And yes, that was more quote democratic in, the, in what, with respect to white male landholders, but it was profoundly problematic in, for many other demographics, especially the dispossession um, and violent dispossession of native people. And that we developed our executive power structures in that context and then uh, into the reservation era. And so the stories that we can tell are not just we've been doing this for a long time, but the results of it. And we have to like the results of it to keep doing it. Um, I, I often have folks ask me about like, do I, do I dislike the plenary power doctrine because it just came from a bad place? And it's like, no, it came from a bad place and it's continued to do bad things over time. So why we keep adhering to that structure that has only resulted in the subordination of people at the margins of American empire, um, maybe we should look at those structures. That's not to say that the structures are necessarily the cause and maybe it's racism that's the cause, maybe it's white supremacy that's the cause. But if we have a government structure that has lent itself only to subordination, if we have these kind of material structures, you know, Fort Sill that was used to house indefinitely native people and their families, so intergenerational uh, detention, that was then used to detain immigrant families, intergenerational detention by the last few administrations. I think we should think about that and those connections between those practices. And when we're talking about good governance, have that conversation rather than we've just been doing it a long time and we celebrate the people who are doing it. We celebrate the ideas that they espoused um, without really looking at the implications for folks on the ground. Um, and that's just more social history um, than, uh, than we have been doing uh, historically in the context of political history. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, I think no, it's that... like, it's hard, it's, it's a really cheap answer to say it's good history rather than bad history. <laughs> but I do think that there is a form of political history um, around democracy in particular that has, that has um, not just shielded us from, from understanding um, why certain practices of ours need to go, uh, but also has shielded us from seeing how democracy has worked so we could learn how to do it better. Um, I have a project with the Tobin Project where we're doing a two volume edited volume on rethinking the history of American democracy that brings together social historians with institutional and political historians, folks who do APD from political science, for example, to really understand how American democracy has functioned so we can have a conversation about how to do it better. Like that is, working conservatism to me. That is like, okay, how do we learn from the past um, and do things that we like and stop doing things that we don't like? Um, but we need to have a real conversation about what we've done. And that history that hasn't captured what we've done, I think is the problem. And we keep pointing to it, um, frankly. And then, you know, to top it all off, now you've forced the Supreme Court to say that breaking treaty promises unilaterally and criminalizing another government is itself good governance without really i mean i it's like i can't it's some of the stuff it's hard to say out loud um right. so I'm, I'm surprised by it but that's what so happens when you reason through things right no that's very helpful and i yeah i still um you know i just always get nervous when when the court is doing history but i'm not nervous about you doing history <laughs> you know? i'm nervous about it i mean it's, i think it's, it's it's such a political act that you're exactly right that it's right. like what do we do when we tell history history right. is itself you know deeply politicized but um 
there is a there there. There's more yeah. of a there there than than folks would like to let on. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, okay, thank you for that. And uh, I have Eunice Leon next, and then Amber Morningstar Buyers after. Hi, Maggie. Thanks so much for the paper and presentation. So I have a question. I think it's about as big as Shalev's question, which is about the relationship between power and text, um, and also the stage setting work that text and formalism do to set, um, sort of set the terms of struggles for power. And actually it's related to what you were just talking about because you know my background is in immigration. So I deal with plenary power all the time in a, in a very different way. Um, setting, especially vis-a-vis -vis rights versus power, um, you know, constitution versus legislation, et cetera. But I was struck in your paper when you say plenary power is about power. Of course, it is about power. It says power in, in the phrase itself. But fundamentally, you know, I think what the doctrine does is it shifts the focus or the locus of struggles from power from one text to the other. So from the Bill of Rights to legislative text um, by virtue of the way plenary power sets up, you know, the power of the federal government and the respective branches of federal government. So I guess my question is, is what, my, my narrow question is, is that, you know, specifically about plenary power and what we kind of, what is seeded sort of by allowing the struggle for power to take place within that doctrine, but also a broader question about, um, about yes, like text, which text and, and how does that relate to power? And you have a really amazing footnote early in your paper, you know, that brings in some of Bordeaux, brings in structuralist thinking. And so that was just one question that kept recurring as I was reading through the paper. Yeah, thank you so much. I think um, the plenary power doctrine um, uh, is itself, for folks who, who don't know, is an, um, largely an extra constitutional power um, that was born of, um, in many ways, the doctrine of discovery, um, but other forms of public international law in the long 19th century, and was domesticated, not just in federal Indian law, but then expanded into immigration in the territories. Um, but is a doctrine that uh, the court hasn't yet fully understood as constitutionally derived or extra constitutional. So therefore, is it uh, bound by the constitution in implementing that power or not? Um, and uh, there is a way in which, um, uh, as you've described, Eunice, that the plenary power doctrine could just be a way of shifting uh, the fight from um, the Bill of Rights to legislative text. Um, and the, there are many people who are, okay, so how do we think about that in the context of social movement organizing and advocacy and legal change? So there are bigger questions about organizing around power. And that's, you know, of course, a, a, a totally separate issue than what you're talking about, which is how power is distributed um, and how power is uh, distributing where the fight is within um, the context of legal reform. And so if you have a fight, for example, over the Bill of Rights uh, that takes you into courts, uh, that takes you into a strategy that then preferences public discourse and changes in public discourse. So you're aiming more at um, changing the way people think. Uh, you're aiming more at a, a court rather than a legislature. Um, and if you look at the history of the last 50 years, um, or probably longer now, because I'm time is flying by, but uh, uh, the last 50 years or 60 years of advocacy of Native nations, um, Native people have had much uh, better success in the context of legislative advocacy than in arguing before courts. Courts have been problematic and have shut down um, efforts to uh, reform the law for Native people uh, over and over again, and they did it much earlier in Indian country than they did for the civil rights movement. You can see a similar pattern in the context of uh, the civil rights statutes. They've held on and been more enduring. So in many ways, those super statutes, uh, those other forms of legal change have been more enduring and more sticky than court-based change. Um, and so the plenary power doctrine in some ways has um, shifted the locus of advocacy into a lower barrier institution and one that is um, more amenable to pluralist advocacy. 
So uh, in some ways it has been better. That's not to say that that's the, uh, that's been a great solution. So uh, in the context of federal Indian law, there is this argument that federal Indian law isn't quote constitutional law um, because it's operating under the plenary power doctrine, which has allowed Congress to override the Supreme Court. Of course, all of our constitutionalist theorists will sit around and go, well, the Congress should be able to override the Supreme Court in con in, with respect to certain constitutional questions. It does it in the dormant commerce clause context. We can find other contexts in which this dynamic occurs, um, but the court hasn't reasoned through that very well in the context of federal Indian law and has instead just classified the entire body of law as quote federal common law rather than constitutional law because it wants to give the Congress a lead in overriding its earlier decisions. Um, because federal Indian law hasn't been considered constitutional law, um, it's not brought into questions of good governance. And we have a whole bunch of, we have generations of legal scholars saying, well, federal Indian law has nothing to do with what I do. Even though if you look at the national government and its formation in the long 19th century, the acquisition of land and the dispossession of land from native people was a massive uh, way that the government formed itself in its earliest years. I mean, it was a driver of its structure. We can't understand it without really understanding these broader, broader frameworks. But I do think that the, the concept of text and formalism, um, especially when you're looking at procedure, means quite a bit when you're thinking about legal change and legal advocacy. Um, in the last 60 years of advocacy, both for Native nations and in the civil rights context, kind of bring that, bring that distinction to the fore of these texts have actually been important and in, in ways are that are more enduring than public discourse and um, court decisions. Um, so these other texts have, have stuck around a little better. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Great, so we have uh, Amber Morningstar Byers on next. And we have until um, 1.15 Eastern, 10.15 uh, Pacific time, just to, so everyone knows. Great, thank you so much, Professor Roisman. Alito Chimachukma, sought to you, Amber on Henley Fitchick Byers. Hello, Ms. Blackhawk, it's an honor to be speaking with you and to be learning from you today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, one being, I just, you know, studying the McGirt decision, I'm from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, so obviously I have a, a, a huge interest in this case and uh, the future of our tribes, uh, the land, uh, jurisdiction, all of it, you know. Um, one thing I keep seeing, uh, and that has been prevalent in federal Indian law since the creation of this country is fear. Fear mongering, fear breeding, uh, you know, listening to the oral arguments uh, made on behalf of the state of Oklahoma, and then also the questions asked by the Supreme Court justices in McGirt, uh, you know, th there's this undertow of fear, you know, well, we can't give land back to the Indians, we can't give jurisdiction back, we can't do this, we can't do that. You know, uh, even RBG, you know, may, may she rest peacefully, asked the question of, well, does this mean all the prisoners are going to get out? You know, what are all the Indian criminals going to be set loose, you know? And and this, this undertow of fear is what I think really pushes back and hinders tribes from getting uh, further along in movements like land back, you know, uh, you know, like perhaps an Oliphant fix, you know, there's, there's so much fear. And I, I think that that fear is based on a lack of education and a lack of understanding of very basic Indian law. Now, my question to you, I guess, is how can tribes use the McGirt decision sort of in tandem with constitutional law to push back against these fearful narratives, these, this rhetoric that says Indian people going back to the, you know, Johnson decision, you know, the, the trilogy that says native people are too savage or, you know, too uncivilized to be governing this land, to be caretaking for it. You know, there's this um, movement now for, for the national parks to be uh, given back to, to the uh, original caretakers, you know, but again, there's this fear 
you know, and so and so my question to you is how can Native nations use this decision to move forward pushing a, a, um, against these harmful narratives that that hinder us from getting further in these movements. And then my second question is, I would like to ask your permission to seek out your contact information. Um, I'm writing a paper, I'm writing my substantial paper on land back. And I'm also going to be working closely with Rebecca Nagel to do research on the McGirt decision over the summer. So everything you're talking about and everything you're writing about is right up my alley. So I would really love to, to get in touch with you and talk further. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, and thank you so much for, um, for even asking for my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. It's just my last name at law.penn.edu. So of course, and it, your project sounds fascinating. And Rebecca Nagel, I um, just um, uh, did an interview with her a short while ago for her new podcast. So it's exciting that you're getting to work with her and exciting that you're being able to, you know, do your substantial paper on land back at an institution. I'm assuming you're, you're a U of A student um, and that's, it's a wonderful place to, to get a law degree. So I'm, I'm glad that you're able to do that and to, to work closely with their faculty. Uh, so with respect to fear, um, you know, uh, the, the, um, I think Heather Gerken's work has a marvelous answer for this, and it's one that I should probably even highlight a bit more in the paper, um, in that I'm not sure that dominant ideology can be undone through public education in the same way. Like, I don't think coming out and just, I, I wanted to believe that it was just the exposure to the basics of federal Indian law that would solve the problem. And I wrote this paper in 2019 thinking like, I'm done. You know, I've, I've pointed it out. Look, federal Indian law is really important. Please but now just go and do that. And I don't think it's done the work that I've, I've wanted it to. And so, which is the reason I followed up with this essay to say, no, there, there's actually more at work than just a lack of awareness. There actually is something, there's there's something entrenched on the other side that we need to do more to undo. And that fear is a part of it and the ideology is feeding the fear. So how do you undo that? Um, so Heather Gerken has this marvelous example about how majority minority governance and local control shift narratives. And that is through the enactment of policies that show that the world uh, that is governed by that group that they want it to, the, the world that they want to exist, the values that they adhere to are not scary. And so by showing rather than telling. And so her big example was the, the city of San Francisco issuing marriage licenses and uh, to same-sex couples and just seeing smiley, happy faces coming out of the, the courthouse gates rather than the slippery slope parade of horribles that was envisioned as a result of the policy. What Indian country can do, and that's what power is about, is about creating a world that defies those expectations. So the next time the public decides to attend to Indian country, we can have examples of, of the world not being scary. As, um, uh, and that may be really difficult. Uh, it may be impossible, uh, but it'll do much to undo decisions like Oliphant, which led to the stripping of criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians from tribal governments to the recognition of it, in large part because as the court said explicitly in that case, uh, it was concerned about the ability of one race to fairly govern another. It actually said that in a 1978 opinion, this wasn't 1878, 1978. Um, and so that fear is, is real. And so I think having more and more examples of the ability of majority minority governments to not only uh, govern fairly, but to enact a true form of liberal, liberal egalitarianism, one that has not been seen in the United States because of the lack of compliance of those who are in power to show that if we shift power to people who do govern fairly, equally, respecting the liberty of their citizens, that we may see a better project of governance within those areas. And that's a hard hurdle to, co to go over, especially under the shadow of colonialism, but it's one that I think Native nations are up for. And um, it's a definitely a better path and it's, it's, my, it's a much more fruitful path than trying to just take the McGirt decision and go, look, we have, we have this, you know, we, we got the court, you know, we have, 
we suddenly got five, you know, the next time we may have four, but that doesn't mean that we're wrong. <laughs> it just means that, um, that native nations need to take this, the same approach that they have in the past, which is to build their worlds up in a way that shows uh, that, you know, what we're doing is, is, is right and just, and in the long run will lend itself to better governance within the United States, especially against a framework that values conquest and violent dispossession over, frankly, democracy and fair governance. Well, that's quite a way to end, I think. Um, <laughs> But I, I think it's an appropriate way to end. Unless anyone has any further questions, I think uh, we will thank uh, Professor Blackhawk for joining us. Um, it was a wonderful paper and presentation and conversation. And thank you all for attending. Um, and you know, good luck with the rest of the semester. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for the engagement. I know it's a busy time.